All right, guys, welcome to the Nitty Gritty Real Estate Podcast here with the Tom J. Cricket team. This week, episode 48, five reasons why the housing market is anything but normal. Let's get into it. All right, guys, so episode 48, Tom J. Krieger team here with our Nitty Gritty podcast, Tom Krieger, Matt Beret. So we are talking about five reasons why today's housing market is anything but normal. Uh, unless you have been asleep for the last couple of years, you will have seen that things have been up and down with the market. So Tom, we're going to dive in. First of all, let's get the different definition of normal. Yep. What's the definition of normal? normal. Let's just get that out of the way. Okay, so Webster's definition of normal is really simple. It's conforming to a type, standard, or regular pattern characterized by that which is considered usual, typical, or routine, possibly customary in an area. So what could be normal in one area may be a little different in another area, but it's customary for it to be like that. So state to state, city to city, country to country. I think it's quite easy to say that in 2020 and 2021, we have not seen usual. No. Nope. We have not seen typical. Nope. And we have certainly not seen routine. No, not so at all. So we're going to break this down into five areas. So number one, Tom, mortgage rates. Let's talk about the how unnormal mortgage rates are right now. Okay. So Matt, I've been in this business for 40 years and I've seen crazy normal, you know, crazy rates that are not normal, but for the time period, they're normal. Yeah. So like in, you know, in the seventies, when I first started buying real estate for myself, owning the houses myself, eight, eight and a half, seven and a half, right in that range there. So if you could get anywhere from seven and a half to eight and a half percent, that would have been what was known as a normal rate all the way into the 80s, just before the 80s, okay? In the 80s, from 80 to about 86, rates were about 12 to 13%. Now, there were some times where we did such creative financing around these mortgage rates that there were 12% on the first half and 18% on the second half of the mortgage. Those are kind of complex mortgages, but you can see from seven and a half to eight and a half, now we're going 12 and a half to 13 and a half with a back end of being 18, That That's not normal. Mm -hmm. It was normal for that window of opportunity. So what made it normal? So in the 70s, what made 7% normal? And in the 80s, what made those 12s and 13s normal? Because we want to transpose that to where we are in 2020, 2021 to show how it's not normal. So set the the tone of how it was normal back then. So in the 70s, it was, there weren't as many loan products that are out there like we have now. Most of them were FHA, uh, you had some VA, uh, you had some Fannies and some Freddies and all those types of products there. And then if you went a conventional type of loan, there was a little bit more uh, stringent requirements of skin in the game. Mm -hmm. So they weren't as risky back then. All right. And inflation was about three to 4% back in the seventies, right? In the beginning, Mm -hmm. as we got into the end of the seventies and into the eighties, inflation got away from us. And that's when we started to see normal with lower inflation rates, become abnormal with higher inflation rates. Gotcha. So the inflation rates back in the 80s when, uh, when, and I'm not, this is not to be political, but when Jimmy Carter was president and, and Ronald Reagan came into the office as presidency, the Fed was just freaked out about the interest rates that were out there and also the inflation because you could have a cost of living of 3%, but your inflation rate was 9%, you're losing 6% of buying value Mm -hmm. in things like bread and butter, Mm -hmm. right? So what they had to do is they had to calm down the inflation and how they calm down the inflation is they tightened up the money supply. And so what that means is money moving in the marketplace, the velocity of the movement of that money had to be slowed down. And how they do that is by raising the interest rates. So it's more expensive to borrow money to invest in, let's say new construction or into plant expansion or into goods purchasing. Mm -hmm. The higher the inflation, the less valuable your dollar is because the the loaf of bread that was 70 cents in January is now a buck 20 in March. Gotcha. Right? So 
As you raise interest rates, you slow the velocity of money. So we got that under control and we started coming into the 90s, right? So it bounced back down to the eight, seven and a half, eight percent where it was in the 70s. So again, the not normal time was only normal for inflation. Then we come into the 2000s and it dropped down again to um, about six, six and a half, right in that area there. The economy is doing good. We recovered from 9-11, everybody remembers that. So there was a little bit of a wonkiness there, but everybody remembers that from 2000 and let's say two to about 2008, money was pretty inexpensive. Mm -hmm. Then we had the crash, right? And we all know what went on in the crash. And then we got through that time frame. And now we're into the time frame of about 2012, 2013. The government wants to start um, people buying back in the homes. We had all of the distressed properties kind of filter through. So they kept pushing the, the interest rates down more and more and more. So people could afford to purchase a house. And now what we've got is 2.9, 2.75. Although as of today, when we're filming this, we're seeing the rates rise back up and there's a lot of chatter about rates not coming back anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're yeah. seeing that. So we're seeing another new normal coming. So I think the 2020s to the 2030s are gonna see a rate hike of interest rates, not to the level of we had in 2000, I mean, sorry, in 1980, but the same percentage jump, mm -hmm. okay? So from eight and a half to 12 and a half. So that's a 50% jump. I easily can see us going from 3% right now to four and a half to 5% by the end of next year, without a doubt. Yeah, yeah. And that's really truly where we were in 2018, 2019, 5%, yeah. four and a half. So yep. we're just going back to our decade normal right in essence yep. okay so mortgage rates number one about an unnormal or an abnormal market number two home appreciation like Perfect. insane yep. right now yep. right we talked about this on a previous episode you know appreciation rates in arizona of 17.9 percent in the state fifth highest appreciated state which is crazy 17.9 on average what four five year over year yep to do us from five to 17, nearly 18% in a year is just bananas. Yep. Like if you had a million dollars in the bank, you'd be very happy at an 18% return on your money, <laughs> right? Yeah. Amen, very brother. happy. <laughs> um, so talk to us a little bit about how, why home appreciation is so abnormal at the moment. Well, I, I like to use the term COVID appreciation because that's what's happened. Very true. Okay, people, and, and uh, this is again, not political, but there were people who just didn't want to sell their houses because they didn't want anybody in their house. They were afraid of dying. They were afraid of getting sick. They didn't know what was going on with this pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden we have buyers that want to leave an area because they don't have to live there to work there because remote things are happening. Zoom meetings, right? Mm -hmm. Look at the stock of Zoom. We all know what happened to that stock. It went fivefold because of the way we're living now. Yeah. So as people could start leaving an area, they didn't need to pay $4,000 a month for a 600 square foot apartment in Seattle. They could move out to let's say Utah and spend that kind of money for a 3,000 square foot home and still work from home. So we had a, a tremendous amount of relocation buyers. And I mean relocation, not that they're changing jobs, but relocating to their workspace. They're change in their economic status exactly. or their economic state right in essence and, and literally state to state exactly they're changing their economic exactly. footprint yeah you know a lot of people don't realize that tennessee was the fifth most moved to state in the united states last year well we have whiskey well that could be and and, and, and probably country music too right and yeah. you go to kentucky because they got fried chicken <laughs> like, let's, let's be real yeah. these, these people have their trends we yeah. have pounds so, so what we were seeing is, is not enough supply in the market mm. and a tremendous amount of demand. Now, normally, the builders will be able to take that up. What's happening with the builders? Supply chain problems, right? Yeah. If you go to the dock in, in LA, you can see they're behind by four to six months. And just recently, the Port Authority um, I'm going to call him the chief in charge. He has another technical name, but the chief in charge. He said that he doesn't see a change until at least the end of the second quarter of 2020. 
Two. Hey everyone, we want to interrupt this episode to let you know that we are a Keller Williams Southern Arizona franchise. Also, we are licensed realtors practicing equal housing. Now, let's get you back to the podcast. Now, that doesn't surprise me. Yeah. When, you, when you calculate, you know, ports being shut down, all the extra safety precautions they've got to have on every item that comes into the nation. Yeah. You know, they've got to sanitize them, clean them. They've, all the employees have to be sanitized and checked and da-da-da-da-da. And then you back onto that, like the Panama disaster that happened at the beginning of this year where that boat got lodged in the Panama Canal, which stopped all shipping routes for like three weeks. It just compounded. And here we are, you, you've got... Was it? I saw an article like fifty thousand vehicles parked in parking lots across yeah, the country because they can't because no truck they, don't, drivers. they don't have the microchips to right. put in the vehicles or the to truck sell. drivers or the truck too. Right? So with this is whole logistics backlog, which as you said yeah. is impacting new builds. They can't get cabinets, toilets, air conditioning units, all that sort of stuff. You know they can't get the materials to finish these homes. Yeah. Um, so we're in that problem. But I look at the home appreciation now. If you went back to twenty, you know twenty twenty. If you had a 24 pack of toilet roll and there was no toilet roll on oh the shelf, oh my god, you could be like, you could print your own money. Yeah, Bill right, Gates, right? And that's what <laughs> people are finding now with their homes. There's not yeah. enough homes to sell. Exactly. So the value of those homes are increasing because more and more people are trying to buy that property. Yep. So you've naturally increased, and we, that's why we had a 20 percent increase or 18 yeah. percent increase. Supply last year. and demand. It's yeah. just the basic ec- it's economics. basic economic 101: yep. supply and demand. Yep. Um, so number three in this top five. The month's supply of inventory is abnormal. Yep. So let's touch on that. Okay. So again, as we talked about, the reason why the uh, appreciation of properties went up is the same reason why we're talking about the amount of homes for sale. Mm -hmm. People are now, just now, starting to feel comfortable putting their house on the market and selling it, okay? They don't mind people coming in. The vaccinations have you know, taken place. A significant amount of us are vaccinated. The builders are catching up, okay? The supply chain is still down the road, so the builders will not be able to keep up with the demand. If people are still wanting to leave where there are, are now in high tax states and, and a, a very expensive cost of living in a state, they want to get out to areas where the taxes are less, your electric bills are less, you're not, it's not so onerous to live in an area. Mm-hmm. We're still going to see supply chain problems, which means the inventory is going to be down. The builders are not going to be able to keep up with the demand. What we will see, though, is the people be are willing to put their homes on the market. So there are more people out there with homes that could be put on the market than there are builders able to build the houses. So I think we're going to see a increase in inventory ever so slow, but an increase in inventory because more and more of the population is opening up to allowing people to come in their house and sell their house. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, us as agents, what's our job? Find them a new house to, to move into. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great point. So just a uh, quick stats here. Generally, uh, or historically, should I say, it's normally six months of supply is associated um, with moderate price appreciation. So what that means is we typically have about six months of inventory on the market at all times. Yeah, that's a neutral um, market. And that's a neutral market. You know, we have literally dropped down to two and a half months or even less. I remember right at the beginning of 20, uh, end of 2020, beginning of 2021, we were 30 to 45 days worth of inventory. Yeah, NAR said we were at 17 days. <laughs> it's like insane numbers. If everybody, if everybody bought a house in 17 days, we'd be out. Yep. I mean, no more, no more homes on the market. Done. Yep. So, um, thankfully, as Tom said, we're starting to see more and more people be more comfortable with selling their home, capitalizing on the appreciation that they've got, making plans. You know, maybe they wanted to sell and move to a different state, but they wanted to wait until things had cleared up, or you know, they were more comfortable moving and transitioning. So we're starting to see more homes. So that'll rise. Um, number four: days that it takes to sell. Again, we're talking about unusual and abnormal. Um, usual, I would say, I don't know, 35, 40 days on the market. Usual in a normal market. 
Well, this is where the age difference comes in, man, because for me, uh, my normal markets were three to six months. Okay. 90 to 180 days. There's a, what we call a neutral market. Okay. Mud, mud huts are hard to yeah, sell. Mud huh? huts are hard to sell. Okay. Right. So I, I like to share with people we are in these um, technology times where everything has to happen immediately. In world of instant gratification. Instant gratification. I want my house sold yesterday, even though I don't have it on the market today, right? Mm -hmm. People have been buying into that, and unfortunately, that is going to come to an end. And we're gonna to start to see days on market start to extend. At the low point here in Tucson, Arizona, it was 17 days, right? We are now up to about 31 days on the market. So it's slowly increasing. We're slowly moving back to a normal market. The problem we have in, in industry, and like I said, I've been doing this for 40 years, The population, the general population is usually six months behind on what's happening. Mm -hmm. Now, with technology, maybe it's four months behind. Uh, but in general, unless you're really paying attention to it, it's about six months that you're behind on what's really happening in the marketplace like we, we feel. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I say to everybody out there, understand you don't need to rush out and buy a house today. There are houses out there that have been on the market for 10, 15, 20 days, and they're, they're not under contract. Yeah. Now, some of them might be overpriced, but we're gonna start to see longer days on the market. And also, we've got buyer fatigue out there right now. Absolutely. You see it as the buyer's agent, yeah, right? Buyers are just absolutely- They're tired. They're writing they're 20 offers and getting offers, rejected. Writing offers, losing, you know, driving around town, spending gas money, or finding a home they love to realize it's already sold, it was sold before it even got on the market. You know, they're just tired of getting beat up. Yep. So they're, you know, they would rather just let a house go past and and be more comfortable in a time to go and see it versus dropping everything, seeing it now and losing. Yeah. You know, so you lose, the, you lose the gratification of finding house. Sometimes it's it, it just fun, right? Yeah. I mean, part of the reason you and I are in this business is because we like to see people smile when they get their house, right? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, we wanna we wanna provide that joy of, of, of a house, especially new new home buyers, right? And who are the ones that have been hurt the most? Yeah, it's the new home buyers. The new home buyers. Yeah, I mean, we bleed for them. Seasoned buyers get it. They understand the market. Seasoned yeah. buyers and sellers get it. But new home buyers, you know, this is a big investment. They've taken that leap of faith. You know, they're willing to literally smash open the piggy bank and tip yeah. out all their pennies, and it just becomes really disheartening. Yeah. And one of the worst calls to make in the you know middle of last year and oh, beginning God. of this is calling up a buyer and saying, hey, we got beat out by another cash offer. Yeah, it, It's just, it was soul breaking. They you feel know? like they're being, being, uh, beating their heads against it. And they can't well. do anything about it. No. It's like, what do I, what can I do? You just can't do anything about it this time. No. We, we just, we will just beat my cash. Yeah. So, so um, that's, uh, you know, the days of market are, are gonna start to expand a little bit. Um, and, you know, America just realized that we're going to get back to a normal pace. It's just going to take a little time. Well, that actually leads right into number five, which is the numbers of offers per listing. Last year, early this year, you know, insanity. Um, I think I mentioned on an earlier episode, there was one listing we had where we had like 27 offers in a 48-hour yes. window, which was bananas. Um, typically, you would see two to two and a half offers per listing or per, per, for, per home for sale. That doubled uh, between 2020 and present to around about four and a half on average. But again, like I said, we've seen homes that had 25, 26 offers. We've, I went to an open house where there was 47 cars parked outside with agents and clients ready to go into an open house. It was bananas. It's like Disney, you're just waiting to go through the turnstile. So that was the abnormality of the market. The, realist, the realistic point that we're in now is that's kind of slowed down. We're not seeing 25, 26, or even 10 offers per property. We're probably going back to three and four. And they're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater like they would have done a year ago. They're not giving up you know, their appraisals. They're not giving up inspections. They're not giving up their first child and paying way over. They're more of a moderate offer. Um, and now it's just really coming down to the finer little tweaks and tunings of the offer instead of the 50,000 overs. So yep. for buyers, that's great. Do not get disheartened. There is still a place for you to write an offer. And for sellers, it's setting the expectation that you know they're not gonna be selling 50, 60, 100,000 over with 27 offers to look at and pick and cherry pick. It's it's slowing down, it is adjusting. Yeah, so think about the, um, the seasoned citizen who's lived in their house for 25 or 30 years and they decide to sell it in an area that is you know, a desirable area, okay? Mm -hmm. 
They put their house on, they listen to the agent, their agent puts it on at a competitive price, right? Two days later, the agent's there with 35 offers. They haven't sold a house in over 25 years, and now they gotta go through 30 offers? Can you imagine how stressful it is on those types of people too? It isn't only the, the buyers, yeah. it's the sellers too. Yeah. So a normal paced, take your time, think about things is where we need to get back to. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So great episode. Five good points here. Mortgage rates, home appreciation. We had months supply of inventory, days on market, and the number of offers. If you want to read through this information, we can definitely put the link to this data, to this uh, to this information uh, down below our podcast, and you can click and go through all of our link trees and get all of these in our blogs as well. Uh, so make sure you stay tuned for episode 49. We're going to be talking about what experts are saying about today's mortgage rates. We mentioned they are shifting, but great episode, Tom. Thank you. You're welcome, And uh, tune in for the next one. Hey, thank you for listening and watching the Nitty Gritty Podcast here with the Tom J. Krieger team. If you are thinking about buying a home, selling a home, or even investing in real estate, please reach out to us. We are local here in Tucson, Arizona, but we are also connected to over 4,000 agents across the US. So again, looking to buy, sell, or invest in your hometown, reach out to us and let us connect you.